Have you noticed what happens when there is really poor leadership of a country? The leader surrounds himself with people who will only say what he wants to hear. The consequence is bad decision making. The people have no choice. The might of the state enforces the people's obedience. So they lose heart and they lose faith. Those that seek to object are ruthlessly brushed aside. The leaders continue to live in splendour, doing as they please, with all that they wish for available for them. It's the people who pay the price for the poor leadership. Inequality, poverty, injustice is their lot. Moments of peace give a blessed release, but it's only for a short while, as immoral leadership makes catastrophic decisions, which the people must again pay for with their livelihood and their lives. War is at the doorstep. I don't know what you think I'm talking about, but I'm trying to help you understand a little bit of what is going on for Isaiah. Because that is the context in which he was preaching. And as we go into the book of Isaiah, that's what we're going to see. It's a vast and complex book with so many wonderful verses that are so well known. Yet it also speaks so clearly into the challenges and issues of society. Then, as of today full of confidence in God's commitment to his people and the faithful covenant-keeping sovereignty of God's. But as you read it, there are questions. Questions that are going on in the background of their minds, just so they need to be also in the background of ours. And so although I'm not going to answer them uh, explicitly today, um, it's good for you just to be thinking around these questions. What does it look like to live under God's rule? Why do we have to live through difficult and testing times? What confidence can we have that we will pull through unscathed? So, what is the issue, the particular issue of Isaiah's time? Uh, if you want some background, you might want to go into uh, 2 Chronicles uh, 26. You'll probably say, I've never read through Chronicles. It's not the most exciting of thing um, as it goes through thing after thing. But that's the kind of the background of what's going on. Uh, if you're in a home group, you might want to read it just so that you know. Uzziah has been a good king. He has strengthened Jerusalem and its surroundings. He's protected his people from attack. And so, uh, as you read through Chronicles, there are good kings and bad kings. Uh, Uzziah is generally called a good king. He's done some good things. But then it all begins to go wrong. Because he thinks that because everything has gone well uh, and the people are safe and everything is okay, that he can do as he pleases. And so he wishes to go and offer sacrifices in the temple. But of course, behind that is this view that it is him and his might and his strength that has secured victory. And so he disregards God, disregards the religious leaders. And so he comes under the judgment of God. Read all of that in 2 Chronicles 26. And we meet Isaiah uh, as a person in uh, 6 verse 1, uh, in the year that King Uzziah dies. Because what will come next is the seeds that Uzziah has sown. Uh, and if you think um, Uzziah was beginning to get bad, Ahaz is terrible. And you can read about him in 2 Chronicles 28. Uh, and so what you hear then is this 
cry, and we're going to look at the first few chapters, this crying out of, God, how have we got into this situation? Let me read to you some verses. This is from chapter 2. You can flip back if you've got a Bible or scroll up on a phone or tablet. From verses 6 to 9. You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. They are full of superstition from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan religion and customs. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses and chariots. There is no end to the chariots. But the land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So people will be brought low, and everyone humbled. Do not forgive them. You see, this is Isaiah's cry. Where the king has gone, the people are going too. They've abandoned their faith in God. The leaders are rich. We see that. There is an abundance of silver and gold. There is an abundance of, of, of chariots and horses and army. But the people suffer terrible injustice. Amos writing at the same time as Isaiah. We're very, very familiar with, you know, uh, let righteousness roll on like a never-ending stream. Uh, who talks about the, the terrible social injustice of that time. But the military might hides spiritual poverty. They love themselves and they believe in their own destiny. Uh, and seeing where the country is going to go, this is what Isaiah says in chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Again, you can look it up if you want. Uh, I will make near youths their officials. Children will rule over them. People will oppress each other. Man against man, neighbour against neighbour. The young will rise up against the old. The nobody against the honoured. A man will seize one of his brothers in his father's house and say, you have a cloak and be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. What Isaiah sees is that because the leadership, the kings of uh, Judah and Israel have failed their people and have led them astray, have themselves gone off with uh, pride and self-enrichment and an abandoning a trust in God, people will follow. There will be anarchy. There will be ruin. It's like kids in charge of the country. Although sometimes one wonders, well, they might not do a better job. That's a completely different story. Um, yeah, let's promote our teenagers' name. So, what's interesting is when Isaiah cries out about all that's going on in the world, about where the leaders are taking people, He's almost saying to God, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Uh, and God answers in chapter 5. Uh, uh, answers with a picture of a vineyard. Uh, uh, you, you've got to love the vineyard in the Old Testament. It's so odd, well, not just because I'm French. Uh, you've got to love it because uh, there is so much imagery around the vineyard. Of course, you remember Jesus picks up uh, the imagery as well uh, when he tells some of his parables. But the Hebrew scriptures often refer to God's people as a vineyard. And Isaiah 5, I'm not going to read it all, but verses 1 to 3, it is just a beautiful description of God's love for the vineyards. But it ends with this verse in verse 4. This is God answering Isaiah. What more could have been done for my vineyards than I have done for it. When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bads? We get this picture of, a, of God who is perplexed. What more could I have done? Haven't I given you everything that you need? Of course, you go through the Psalms, you go through the wonderful story of God's people, 
uh, you know, the, the rescue, the exodus, the provision of judges and kings and leaders and prophets. I've given you everything you need. I've given you bountiful harvest. I've given you safety. I've given you a, a, a land where you can live and you can build uh, your cities and you can build a temple to worship gods. Haven't I given you abundantly, God is saying? Haven't I cherished you and been faithful to you? And so God says, you know, if I'm faithful to Isaiah, how could these people be so faithless? Why are they two-timers? Why are they people who just allow their eyes to wander to everyone but myself? It's worth pausing here before we get into Isaiah chapter 6 and say, why is the role of the king so important? Because, of course, we, you know, in our day and age, we kind of uh, take our leaders with a kind of a pinch of salt. We kind of expect them not to be great. Uh, we're surprised when they are, but kind of when the news and something else comes out, you're just thinking, well, that's just the way they always are. But why is it that the king is so important in the Hebrew Scriptures? It's because in the ancient world, uh, an image of a god or king was considered to represent that god or king. There's a, there's a real tie-up between your status and your behaviour. So your behaviour needs to flow from who you are. And of course we know that. If we go back, right back to Genesis chapter 1, I'm sure you know the verses, what we are told Human beings are created in God's image. Humans alone are recognised as those made in the image of God. And so therefore they are to live in a way that gives evidence to the claim that God is the Lord and King over all creation. And when they are entrusted with the stewardship of the world, it's because having the image of God, they are to act as if uh, they are in God's place. And that's the, why the stewardship is so important. Because they are to live in such a way that brings glory and honour to God, to entrust them with that stewardship. You do because of what you are. And so when the king struck, when the kings fail to live in a way and rule in a way that shows how God, in fact, wants us to live, then the people struggle. Because the king, given to them by God to demonstrate how to live, how to care, how to love, how to govern, actually, they don't. They don't demonstrate God's rule. They actually just live for themselves. And the thing is, is that if the kings take on a role which is so important and yet live in another way, then they fail to model faithfulness, loving care, abhorrence of injustice and bias. They don't serve or care for the people, but they look after their own needs. Yet kings were called long before the words were applied to Jesus to be tenders of the vineyard or a good shepherd caring for God's people. So kings have a privileged role but a particular duty in the Hebrew scriptures. If the people wander off, it is the role of the king and shepherd to bring them back. But of course, what are the people to do if actually the king is the one who has wandered off first? So when pressures and temptations might lead God's people astray, the king, if he's not a model of faithful worship and trusting in God, the people have no way to turn. And so Uzziah at the end of his reign, and particularly when we get into Ahaz, Ahaz lives like this. He will look to every single way but God. 
He would trust in every scheme, every other religion, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's why Isaiah, uh, different to Jeremiah who speaks to the people, uh, Isaiah wants to speak directly to the king. And he will do this in our hearing because the king needs to hear what God thinks of their leadership of their people. But before we go into that, because we'll have four or five weeks uh, of that, it's worth looking at Isaiah's own call. And that comes in chapter 6, after uh, Isaiah has complained about what he sees uh, and what God says in response. Uh, I want you to, just to pick out a few things here from uh, chapter 6, those first few verses. Uh, I love that. Um, the idea that he comes and he sees this fantastic vision. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. He has an encounter with God in the temple. And what he sees is both the kingship of God and his holiness. Do you see how king language floods through that with the references to the throne and the train and all these other things that reference a king? He sees unmistakably that God is his king, but that God is a holy God. That's the first thing. And then secondly, what we see is the reality of his own situation. Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I live, live amongst the people of unclean lips. Then actually, what he realises more than anything else is his own sense of unworthiness before a holy God. He is convicted of his sinfulness. And, and it doesn't lead him to run away. He doesn't go shuffling off and saying, well, I can never be here. But actually, because he's in the presence of God, he's got this, he's in this throne room, he just acknowledges, he bows the knee and says, Lord, I am unworthy. And because of that confession of sin, you see the cleansing. Don't try this at home. <laughs> you know, but there he takes, you know, the coal from the fire uh, is taken and it's touched to his lips. God offers him cleansing. He is clean. God enables him to live, to stand, to be in God's presence. And because of that cleansing, uh, then what, you, you, what you then see is the call to serve. You know, who shall I send? You've got to not be around when God asks that question, because there's only one answer, isn't there? Uh, 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 okay, okay, I'll, I'll go. But you know, Isaiah is great. It's not like Moses. Uh, I love Moses. Moses had five excuses as to why he couldn't do what God asked him to do, uh, and he still had to go and do it. But he's commissioned. God says go, and he tells them uh, what you need to do. But of course, it's not easy, is it? Go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Verse 9, keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Verse 10, may the heart of this people be fat. I like the idea of fat hearts. Uh, and, and their eyes heavy and drooping, blinding their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear and understand with their hearts. Good. When I said says, said me, he says, okay, I'll send you. But it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. They're not going to listen. It, it's really interesting, isn't it, when you just think a little bit about why did he, keep, why did he go? 
Because of course, you get to the end of the chapter uh, and you say, and through the tenth remain, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak. Who stumbles? This idea of remnant is there right at the very beginning of his call. God will not abandon his people. There will be a true Israel that will emerge from Israel. He will not, in a sense, ask him to do a thankless or worthless task. There is hope, even in his call. There's loads of hope in Isaiah, and we'll get to that in coming weeks. What do we make of Isaiah's call? Those three things. The awareness of the holiness of God, the aware of uh, and the conviction of sin, um, uh, and then also that, that calling, to, that commissioning to serve. Uh, one of the people um, I, I never got to hear um, in uh, real life, I wished I had, um, but I, I have heard him. Um, uh, through some of the recordings, um, was a guy called uh, Festo uh, Kimingeri, um, who was um, an Anglican bishop in Uganda, had to flee for his life uh, under the persecution um, of Idi Amin, but was somebody who was central to the East African revival. Um, if you haven't been, um, uh, if you haven't ever read anything about the East African revival, I'm sure Lynn has, you can uh, tell you loads, uh, Anik, is, is Anik here this morning? Uh, no, Anik's not here. Um, but there are a, a number of people who have uh, lived and worked in those areas, and it's so, so significant for that whole area of uh, East Africa and for the embedding of true discipleship and faith in those communities. Um, and Festo is one of the leaders of that. He said that actually there is no true encounter with God without that deep personal conviction of sin. Now, if this were an East African revival meeting, uh, we'd have been inviting you all up at the end of the service to come and confess your sins publicly, uh, because that was what they did, um, and uh, unashamedly, and you'd be telling the whole congregation uh, everything that you've done wrong. Uh, that's not, in a sense, what I'm trying to encourage us to do, although if you feel, what, you feel the need to do that, uh, then do, do come up. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is, is that what Festa you say is, if we don't take sin uh, and that conviction of sin seriously enough, as it actually is something that we need to understand and address, then we say to us, oh, it's not really that bad. You know, I just do a few things, but it's not really that bad. Then we diminish the value of the cross of Christ. If we say to ourselves, well, yeah, I've done a few things, but actually uh, others have done far more than me. They've done far worse things. You know, I, I'm not bad compared to them. We, we're enabling ourselves to think that we're fine. And that's what the kings of Israel did. Well, they, they, they turned around and the kings of Judah said, there were people who were far worse than me. I'm not that bad. Or even worse, in so many areas of our society today, and so many of the challenges that we face, it's just easy to convince ourselves and say, well, God doesn't really mind, does he? Kind of, it's not that bad. Festo and many of the writers that have been inspired by him and the church leaders that have been inspired by him have said, if we truly understand our own human sinfulness, only then do we understand truly the cross of Christ. It's picked up by uh, modern writer, some you know, um, European writers, uh, John Stott clearly has written it, J.R. Packer has written about it, uh, Gordon Fee has written about it um, in, in Canada and America. There are so many people who've said actually, we can't worship Jesus as our Lord and Saviour until we really understand how much we need rescue. And that's not about frightening people into, you know, you, you've got to become a Christian because, you know, we're, we're trying to, to fill you with fear of something. But actually it's about seeing the reality of who we are and whether we can help ourselves or not, whether we can rescue. And of course, once we realise that we can't, then actually we are so more prayerful. 
Uh, uh, and that was the thing that, you know, Festo said, uh, you can read, I, I've got his autobiography, what, a biography of him, if you want to borrow it and read something about it. You know, but he said, the two things that mark genuine, genuine encounter with God is firstly this real conviction of sin. The second, he said, is that everyone will realise the importance of prayer. And in the churches he led, there were as many people, if not more, who came to the prayer meetings each week than came to the Sunday worship sessions. That could be because Sunday worship lasted three hours. But, I, I, you know, it, I don't know if it's that. You know, it, it's because people realise, actually, how much we need God's intervention. We can't rely on our own means. We can't rely on our own resources. We have to rely on God's. And that's great, isn't it? Because when we realise that, do you notice that, you know, when Isaiah says, you know, woe is me for I am undone, God doesn't leave him hanging. You know? He says, oh, I'll think about it, Isaiah. I'll come back in a day or two and let you know what, I, what, what, what might be possible. You know, I'll, I'll negotiate some kind of contract with uh, the heavenly authorities to see whether we might be able to sneak you in the back door. That moment of realisation, that confession, that coming, that comes from his deep conviction, God says, let me restore you. And that's good, isn't it? Because the encounter with God is never to send us away thinking that we are rubbish, that we have no part to play, that somehow we are insignificant and unworthy. No, uh, encounters with God are always cleansing. And the fire of atonement, which is a pointer to what Jesus will achieve uh, on the cross, uh, it means that the encounter with God is restorative. We hear that. It's become a buzzword, hasn't it? Uh, Now, we hear of restorative justice. How do you put right something that was done wrong? Uh, And there's all kinds of things, and that's not really what I want to go into. But it's here we see it. That his encounter with God means that he is restored, enabled to be, and enabled to do. And therefore God says go. And he has a particular call to go and speak to a particular people at a particular time, but also speaking to us. But we are no different. If you're sitting there thinking, oh, that was just I, you know, God spoke to him and everything was fine. No. God calls each and every one of us in that same way. Because we each have a particular situation in which we are put. Whether it's at school, at home, at work, amongst our friends. God has called us to be in that place, to be his. And to live under God's rule in that place. As a forgiven sinner. Somebody who is chosen and commissioned. Living life. So if you're wondering, what does it mean to live under God's rule? It's not about the government, about which country you live, about whether uh, things are stable or at war or at peace, whether they are prosperous or in famine. It's about recognising that we are forgiven sinners, chosen and commissioned here and now, for this place, to live a holy life. So why was Isaiah's calling so difficult? Well, the obvious answer is because he was waiting for Jesus to come. Once Jesus came, everything would be sorted. (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of true. Um, But it's not the only perspective. I have a wedding ring. It's still vaguely shining. Uh, Annie and I were really privileged. Uh, We had a friend who was um, a retired uh, goldsmith. Uh, And he had lumps of gold in his safe (laughs) at home. Uh, And he had all his tools in his workshop at home. And he said, why don't you you and Annie come round? Uh, And um, he said, I I will make your rings for you um, over the course of the meal. You know, we'll, we'll do some of it before. And then we'll, we'll lead and then you know, we'll do a bit more and we'll have puddings or desserts and then we'll go and finish it off. And it's amazing to watch. And 
it started off with a kind of a little square of gold, and he kind of hammered it and did all the things that he knows how to do until it was a nice ring shape. Um, and then he kind of, you know, kind of stuck it under the, the blowtorch and all the rest of it, and to, so the joins went. Uh, and then, you know, he looked at it and said, yeah, and, you know, let, let it cool for a bit, and then we'll try it on sides. So we went off and eat. And he came back, and he, he's got these wedding rings. And then he said, do you want to try them on? And so we tried them on, and he, you know, and, and I remember looking at it thinking, is this it? <laughs> is this it? <laughs> you know, because actually, uh, uh, under the torch and all the rest of it, it, it was, you know, it was kind of, you know, the, it was full of, uh, of impurities, and it was kind of black and around the edges and stuff. Uh, and I said, well, he's a friend. He just don't dare say anything. You know, he just smiled. And, he, just, and, and he, he obviously knows, because he looked me in the eye and says, don't worry. He said, trust the process. And then he, he, he took them off in a rush and he put them in the fear in the corner of the kind of little place he had and, and the blowtorch was torn turned up to its highest higher setting and then he just torched the rings and we watched and you watched and then all the impurities just bubbled to the surface they bubbled to the surface and then he says and this is where we see that I've done a good job and he got his tongs too hot to touch and it was white hot at this stage picked it up dropped it in some um, concentrated sulfuric acid, fished it out again, again with the tongs, not putting his hands in, and there was this beautiful, shining, pure piece of gold. Of course, we're familiar with that if we've read Malachi, and uh, where it talks about, you know, God is a refining fire. But actually, there are times when we have to go through the process with God. It would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if straight away that we came to Jesus uh, and we came to him, that we were instantly perfect. I mean, I know I am. No, yeah. Uh, if any of my kids are here. Uh, <laughs> they would go, oh, actually, <laughs> you know, it would be great, wouldn't it, if we could just be perfect straight away. If our children could be perfect, love each other, you know, uh, not, not kind of do all the things that kids do. Uh, and, and for the same, for us not to have to struggle with some of the things that tempt us or pull us down or things like that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if instantly when we came to Jesus, we were just perfect people? But we're not. And therefore there are times when God calls us to do things. And actually... As we do those things, we grow. We are challenged, but we are refined. Some of our edges get knocked off. Some of our impurities get burned out of us. We begin to shine, but then we're tarnished again and we have to go through a little bit more. And, and that's what Isaiah has to do, because sometimes it's hard. And it's hard also as Christians because actually the sharing of the message of Jesus is hard. Because actually who wants to hear? Romans 1, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We want to be able to say to people, don't we, the reality that you know, God loves you and it's great and you're doing well and you're lovely. And that's a kind of a nice positive. But actually at some point... We have to enable people to see why Jesus came to rescue them and the problem that we've fallen short. We don't love God. We can't be our own king. We can't decide for ourselves. We can't rule our own lives. And actually people don't want to be told that, do they? It's much nicer to say, be who you want to be. Do what you want to do. Everything is possible for you. Reach out to the stars and you can do it. But of course, the gospel is, it's just two sides, isn't it? That actually with God, everything is possible. And he can transform us and enable us to be people that we could never have dreamed of before. But it starts with that encounter with God and that deep conviction of sin. And Isaiah had to go and say to people, you're trying to rule yourselves. 
And I didn't want to hear. As they won't want to hear us. It's hard. But we need to remember, don't we? That that encounter with God is a restorative process. That actually, God isn't vindictive. He, wasn't, he isn't just bringing us to himself saying, Oh, I told you so, I've got you now. Because actually he wants us to be the kind of people that we want to be. And need to be. But he has to refine us. And that's why it's hard sometimes to follow Jesus. To live it. To share it. But that's okay. Why is it okay? Because Isaiah sees hope. Verse 13, it's the hope that's there, isn't it? Uh, about there will be a remnant. Yes, God will bring judgment on this people who were turning away and rejecting him and, and relying on military strength and might rather than godliness. But actually what we'll read in Isaiah and we'll hear it more and more is that actually covenant blessings will be restored. That's what they're saying there. There will be a stump. There will be something. Someone is being prepared off stage to be introduced. Not my job to do that this week. Uh, Patrick is doing that next week, so I'll stop there. But actually, um, it, the chapters that will follow, Isaiah will re reveal this fantastic vision of the one who will come uh, and sort it. And his vision will go on beyond. Uh, and will end, as you'll see when uh, I think I'm preaching again in five weeks' time, uh, on the very end. Uh, and the hope of the new heavens and the new earth where the lion will lay down uh, with the lamb, where the, where the swords will be uh, beaten into plowshares. There is this wonderful vision of what is possible for humanity and where humanity is going, but with Jesus when he is ruler of all the earth. So what's the hope that pulls us through? It's a little bit like the video said. The hope that pulls us through, I think, is because actually Isaiah said all these things. He never got to see Jesus. We're, however many thousands of years later, two and a half thousand years later, looking back, we know that they've been fulfilled. We know that that word is uh, listenable to and trustworthy and good. That's the hope that pulls us through. As we sang earlier, not just the whole world, but each and every one of us that knows and trusts Jesus is secure in his hands. So, some questions for you to ponder. Over the meal table at lunchtime, where there's a family, uh, over coffee in the hall afterwards, with friends this week. In a home group. How does your experience of meeting with God compare with Isaiah's? Are there things that you need to address because of it? That's question one. How does your experience of meeting with God compare to Isaiah's? Are there things that you need to address as a result? Question two. If God is our king and we live under his just and gentle rule, what are the areas that you most struggle in laying before him? What are the areas that you most struggle with? And how are you going to progress? So that it becomes less of a struggle over time. And thirdly, this is a good one. <laughs> if you've got the answer, tell me. But how does an understanding of God's eternal purpose as we read it in Isaiah and seeing the whole of salvation history as we will do uh, uh, unfolded for us in those prophecies? How does it help us to pray into the situation in Ukraine? Not just the obvious things, that the vulnerable we protected, that peace would come. But how do we see God's purposes at work? How do we pray 
into God's purposes and what's going on. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Isaiah, for this amazing book. It's got so much in it that we're just going to dip our toes into it. But we thank you for it so much. We pray that you would uh, help us to just get a picture of the wonder it is to know you as our King and to live under your rule. But Heavenly Father, we know that that's complex in the world in which we're in. We're pulled in so many different ways. There are so many influences, so much uncertainty as what we need to do and be. Heavenly Father, just help us in the quietness of our own hearts to know and understand that you are our King and give us your grace and spirit to enable us to live as though that is true.